Hello all. Apologies for the short break in the upload schedule. I had real life stuff to be getting on with, and if you follow my Twitter, you know that my original idea for the next podcast episode had to be canned. Worry not, I am back and on schedule for the foreseeable future. For all that said, let's proceed with this week's episode. Welcome to the History Raid Podcast. I'm your host, Kieran Kovach. Today's topic, the Glyndur Rising, part one of two. A quick geography lesson for non-British listeners. Wales is the smallest and most obscure of the four nations that make up the British Isles. Everybody knows what England is due to the, you know, whole spearheading of an empire that covered a quarter of the globe thing. Everyone knows what Ireland is thanks to your friends and family that utilise St. Patrick's Day to justify a wild one down the pub. And finally, everyone knows what Scotland is thanks to a terrible Mel Gibson movie. Wales lacks this same international profile as its sister nations, forcing me to fall back on this rather old childhood definition of Wales. For your consumption, Wales is that weird sticky outy bit sandwiched between the English Midlands and the Irish Sea. Cheeky buggers clearly beat us to the copyright there. Also, I may be crazy, but I swear Northwestern Wales always looked to me a lot like a man throwing something, being pursued by the dragon head shaped southwestern Wales? I mean, just, just some food for thought there. Wales has historically been very culturally distinct from almost the entirety of the rest of Britain. Unlike Scotland and Ireland, Wales was conquered by the Romans, but unlike England, the Welsh managed to successfully repel the Anglo-Saxon invasions of the 5th to 7th centuries. Wales' closest cultural brethren are the Cordish people of southwestern England and the Bretons of northwestern France, both of whom have native languages very similar to Welsh. Uh, this is believed to have been the result of, sort of ancient patterns of tribal migration and trade between the regions. For most of Wales' early medieval history, it was divided into several minor kingdoms that squabbled amongst themselves, while enjoying an uneasy relationship with their mighty English neighbours. Until the Norman conquest of England in the 11th century, Wales had something of a little brother big brother relationship with England. The Anglo-Saxons generally left the Welsh alone, and in return Wales acknowledged England as the local big dog. Tensions did occasionally spark up between Wales and England, however. Notably, the Welsh King Griffith ap Llywelyn managed to unite all of Wales under his rule in 1055, provoking the future English King Harold Godwinson and his treacherous brother Tostig to invade Wales in 1062. This potential threat to England's western border was extinguished when Griffith, who was the only man who could claim to be the king of a truly united Wales in its, in its entire history, was murdered in 1063, likely by a jealous former rival, leading to the disintegration of Wales back into several minor kingdoms. With the Norman conquest in 1066, the new Scando-French lords of the Anglo-Welsh borderlands were given free reign to conquer the weak and divided Welsh. The challenging geography of Wales, particularly the mountainous north, meant that Norman progress was slow. This wasn't helped by the fact that the Welsh resisted doggedly, making effective use of guerrilla tactics armed with spears and longbows. The latter weapon's efficacy would see it become a fearsome part of the English arsenal in later wars. By the beginning of the 13th century, Wales was officially under English rule. The south and east was mostly ruled by Anglo-Norman lords, called marcher lords, 
while the north and west was mostly ruled by native Welsh lords, who had sworn loyalty to the English king. Wales during this period was something of a wild frontier, with the English kings exercising very little in the way of control or oversight over the lords of Wales. As a result, wars between the different lords of Wales were common, and for a brief ten-year period, from 1230 to 1240, Llewellyn the Great, the Prince of Gwynedd, became the effective ruler of Wales, after several successful military campaigns against rival Welsh princes and marcher lords. Two quick points here. Firstly, in the context of 13th century Wales, prince was simply an alternative title to king. Secondly, Llewellyn the Great never revoked his oath of loyalty to the King of England. In fact, Llewellyn's wife Joan was the bastard daughter of King John, which cemented a close alliance between Llewellyn and the infamous king. Fun fact, John's close relations with Llewellyn, with him refusing to support the English marcher lords against the Welsh upstart, was one of the many reasons for the revolt against him in 1215 by his barons, the one that led to the creation of the Magna Carta. Llewellyn's descendants would continue to be powerful figures in Wales, going so far as to style themselves as the Princes of Wales, not simply the Princes of Gwynedd, as their illustrious forefather had. This was until Prince Llewellyn ap Griffith, known as Llewellyn the Last, for reasons that will quickly become evident, made the extremely ill-advised decision of disrespecting the newly crowned King of England, Edward I, in 1277. The future Hammer of the Scots proceeded to crush the Welsh princedom in two military campaigns, the first in 1277 and the second in 1282 to 1283. Following these conquests, Edward stripped almost all of the Welsh lords of their lands, dividing them between himself and the marcher lords. Edward would spend much of the rest of his reign solidifying his rule in Wales. Most famously, Edward built a series of formidable castles around Wales to help suppress any future Welsh revolts. Edward also named his son, the future Edward II, as Prince of Wales in 1307, gifting him the lands he had seized off the Welsh lords and granting him Llewellyn the Last's old title. The Prince of Wales continues to be the formal title of the heir to the English throne to this day. Finally, laws were brought in that formally made the Welsh second-class subjects, with Edward expelling the Welsh from many Welsh towns and off the best farmland. They were replaced by English settlers, who quickly became wealthy off of the lucrative trade taking place in these English-only towns, towns which Welsh traders were forced to pay a toll to enter. Sound familiar, Irish listeners? Such laws would be a major source of resentment, rather understandably, for the Welsh going forward. Also, fun aside, it is commonly accepted for Edward's expulsion of the Jews from England in 1290, seizing their wealth and property in the process, was motivated in large part by the spiralling costs of his castle building in Wales. Additionally, Edward had to raise additional money by frequently calling parlaymonts, or in English, parliaments, with his lords, where in exchange for certain political concessions, they would agree to taxes levied by the crown. As such, both the relatively democratic character of British monarchies going forward, and one of the most infamous acts of European anti-Semitism, stemmed in large part from the subjugation of the Welsh. Edward's efforts to subjugate the Welsh were ultimately successful. He crushed a 1294-1295 revolt by a distant cousin of Llewellyn the Last, and in 1378, an English assassin killed the last direct male descendant of Llewellyn the Great, Owain Laugoch, seemingly ending any Welsh claims to the title Prince of Wales. In 1399, a major dynastic upheaval would strike England in turn. After years of misrule, Richard II, the last king of the Plantagenet dynasty, would be overthrown and imprisoned by the English nobility. The man chosen to replace Richard was Henry Bolingbroke, the son of Edward III's fourth son, John of Gaunt. This rather tenuous claim to the English throne allowed Henry to become Henry IV, 
the first king of the new Lancastrian dynasty. Henry IV would face backlash almost immediately. Two months after Henry's coronation in October 1399, a group of English earls conspired to murder Henry at a tournament and restore the imprisoned prison Richard II to the throne. The plot was discovered, however, and ended up becoming the Epiphany Rising, a short-lived open revolt in England's western counties that Henry successfully crushed by February 1400. The imprisoned Richard II conveniently died on the 14th of February. It is believed that Henry ordered his jailers to deliberately starve him to death in an unconvincing ploy to cover up his murder. Richard's death did little to cement Henry's position. Henry was not the only English lord descended from royalty, and given the weak nature of Henry's own claim to the throne, many other English lords began asking the obvious question. If Henry could seize the throne, why can't I? In the north, the Scottish utilised the chaos in England to raid into northern England, hoping to reclaim lost territories. To the south, the French, ever eager to capitalise on English weakness, began waging a naval cold war, with English and French pirates clashing in the English Channel and the North Sea. Finally, in Wales, there were ominous grumblings, and one of these ominous grumblers was a certain Owain Glendour. In 1400, Owain Glendour, who would have been in either his early 40s or 50s at the time, was one of the few Welsh landowners left in Wales, ruling over a respectable estate in the modern-day county of Denbyshire, in northeastern Wales. On his father's side, Owain was descended from the old kings of Powys in eastern Wales. On his mother's side, he was descended from the old kings of De Hoibarth in southern Wales. These prestigious bloodlines saw Owain become a popular figure amongst the influential Welsh poets who praised Owain as an embodiment of military virtue and wrote poems that insisted Owain was also descended from the princes of Gwynedd in northern Wales. These Welsh poets, who were very well regarded in Welsh society, very deliberately built an image in the minds of many Welsh people that Owain constituted something of a fulfilment of prophecy, a great man who as a coalescence of the Welsh royal dynasties was destined to rule all of Wales as its prince. If Glyndor had any ambitions to lead an independent Wales before 1400, he certainly wasn't open about it. In fact, before 1400, Owen would appear to be very much the model of an assimilated, civilised Welshman. The death of Owen's father, when he was still young, saw Owen being fostered by an English knight in England called David Hamner, possibly studying law in London for a time before marrying his foster father's daughter Margaret upon his return to Wales in 1383. He would then enter military service from 1384 to 1387, fighting in King Richard II's army against Scotland and France. During his military service, he met and befriended the renowned Welsh knight Sir Gregory Sykes, and served under the prominent English nobleman Richard Fitzalan, the fourth Earl of Arundel. With these two influential patrons, it seems Owain might have had a chance to break through the anti-Welsh glass ceiling that existed at the time. And it wasn't just his martial skills that were allowing him to make inroads in English politics either. In 1386, Owain's legal skills were also seemingly called upon, with him being called to give evidence at the famous Scrope vs. Grovesner legal case a proto-copyright law case between two knights who had discovered during Richard II's 1385 Scottish campaign that they shared the exact same coat of arms. How awkward. Unfortunately for Owen, 1390 saw his political fortunes dealt a serious blow when Sir Gregory Sice died and his other patron, Earl Richard Fitzalan, fell out of favour at the King's court. Owain seemingly gave up on advancing himself politically at this stage, returning to Wales the same year to manage his estate, flying under the political radar for the next 10 years. It would appear that much of this decade would be spent sparring with his neighbour, 
the Marcher Lord Baron Reginald Grey, who had long claimed that some of Owain's lands rightfully belonged to him. The overthrow of Richard II brought the simmering tensions between Owain and Grey to a boil. Owain, along with many other Welsh lords, had been supportive of Richard II, and disapproved of the usurping Henry IV. Grey, by comparison, would have been delighted. Grey was an old friend of King Henry, and quickly became influential in the king's court. This gave Grey the confidence to seize the disputed lands off of Owain. It is worth mentioning at this point a major topic of debate regarding Owen Glendur. That is, what was Owen Glendur's initial motivation to rebel against England? Those who hold a more idealised view of Glendur would claim that Glendur had always been a Welsh patriot at heart, and that he always intended to free Wales from English oppression if he got the chance. More cynical observers have argued that open rebellion was very much out of character for Glyndwr, and that Owain's ultimate decision to try and establish an independent Welsh princedom was a result of snowballing events not fully under Glyndwr's control. For you Game of Thrones fans in the audience, let us look back for a moment to the sunny uplands of seasons 1 to 3, or books 1 to 3 if you prefer and the character of Rob Stark. In George R. R. Martin's story, Rob Stark is certainly familiar with the romantic old stories of the independent Northern Kingdom, but his initial motivation for his rebellion against the Crown is the imprisonment of his father and sisters, with his only goal being to free his family. After his father's death, Rob's rebellion was left somewhat aimless until the title King in the North and the commitment to free the North from Southern rule that came with it was thrust upon him by his lords, escalating his rebellion to the point that negotiation or compromise was impossible. Certain interpretations of Glyndur's rebellion strike a very similar tune and should be kept in mind as we go forward. Owain's initial response to Grey's actions was to appeal to the English Parliament to have his lands peacefully returned. The English Parliament, possibly due to actions on the part of Henry IV to protect his buddy Grey, refused to hear Owain's case, which effectively constituted a tacit acknowledgement of Grey's claim to those lands. Not satisfied with Owain's legal defeat, Grey majorly escalated his dispute with Owain by deliberately delaying news of a royal command demanding that lords contribute troops towards defending the border with Scotland. Thanks to this underhanded move, Owain did not provide any troops to the king, and Grey was able to denounce Glendur as a traitor in London court circles. Either out of anger or a fear of King Henry's impending wrath, Owain struck first. In September 1400, Owen proclaimed himself the Prince of Powys, and by extension, the lands of eastern Wales. Owen then attacked Grey's lands, burning and looting several towns. Simultaneously, on the island of Anglesey in northwestern Wales, which, by the way, is where I am from, a prominent local family called the Tudors, yes, those Tudors, rose up in support of Owen namely the brothers Gwilym ap Tudor and Rhys ap Tudor. Quick note here, the proper Welsh pronunciation of Tudor is Tidir, but for the sake of convenience I will use the anglicised version the name eventually morphed into. King Henry was returning from an inconclusive military campaign in Scotland when he heard the news of Glendua's rebellion, and in November he marched into North Wales to stamp out the rebels. Henry's first campaign was fraught with difficulties. Owain knew he couldn't defeat Henry's mighty army on the battlefield, instead he ordered his men to use guerrilla tactics against the English. The English army was not familiar with the hilly and mountainous geography of North Wales, with Glyndwr's men being able to easily melt back into the scenery after their lightning attacks on the advancing English army. The English's woes were further compounded by bad weather, slowing their advance further. This is a pattern we will see repeated throughout much of Glyndur's rebellion. It is worth remembering at this point in history, it is estimated that a mere 250,000 people 
lived in Wales, compared to approximately 2.5 million people in England. Owain simply could never raise a large enough force to defeat the English in a major open field battle, which necessitated the English use of guerrilla tactics to slowly wear down the English armies. The most important goal of the Welsh guerrillas was to disrupt the ability of the invading English army to keep themselves supplied with essentials such as food and water. Medieval armies could largely sustain themselves by living off the land, sending out bands of men to forage and steal from the locals. Whenever possible, medieval commanders would also organise supply lines from their home territories to ensure a steady stream of supplies if the areas the army was operating in became too devastated to sustain them. By picking off English foraging parties and raiding the lightly defended English supply lines, Glendua's forces were able to force the English to retreat back to England, as supplies began to run low much earlier than expected. All this would be aided by the consistently poor weather in the form of wind, rain and snow during English campaigns against Glendua. English soldiers, who already regarded Wales as a rather dark and mysterious place, would begin to accuse Owen Glendur of being a sorcerer, using dark magics to turn the weather against them. King Henry's first campaign would reach Anglesey, where, unable to force the Tudors to face him in battle, Henry attempted to punish them by burning villages across the island. The first English campaign against Glendur formally ended in October 1400, with no notable successes. In 1401, much of northern and central Wales went over to Owain. For those Welsh nobles and commoners opposed to Henry IV and eager to see the hated English thrown out, Glyndwr and his Tudor allies' success in forcing an English retreat proved that the rebellion stood a chance of succeeding. While still determined to crush the rebellion, King Henry found himself in a difficult position. Alongside the expenses of fighting cold wars against Scotland and France, the English Parliament began accusing him of fiscal mismanagement in 1401, tightening the purse strings of the English nobility. Rather than immediately spend his own dwindling funds on another military campaign, King Henry tagged in the renowned English knight Henry Hotspur Percy, the eldest son of the powerful Earl of Northumberland, and a veteran of several campaigns in Ireland, France and Scotland. By the way, Hotspur isn't his actual middle name, but it is a very famous nickname that I can't help but use when referring to Henry Percy. It also helps differentiate him from his father, who was also called Henry Percy. When Owain and the Tudor brothers heard of Hotspur's imminent arrival, they hatched a cunning plan in order to gain an upper hand in the coming confrontation. On the 1st of April, Good Friday, a carpenter arrived at the gates of Conway Castle, announcing he had arrived to carry out routine maintenance. Conway Castle was one of the most magnificent of Edward I's Welsh castles. Despite only having a garrison of 75 men, the formidable defences made a direct assault nigh on impossible. Surrounding and starving the defenders out was also not practical, due to the considerable stores of the castle and the fact that the castle could potentially be resupplied from the nearby coast. Luckily for the Welsh rebels, they planned on doing neither. When the carpenter was allowed entry to Conway Castle, he subdued the two guards protecting the main gatehouse. The disguised Tudor infiltrator was able to achieve this without raising the alarm, as most of the castle's garrison was at mass in the town of Conway. Upon a signal from the infiltrator, 40 other Tudor men, led personally by Gwilym and Rhys, rushed into the castle, capturing the mighty fortress without losing a single man. This left Hotspur in a rather awkward position when he arrived in Conway. He had not brought enough men to carry out a siege, but was also seemingly unwilling to endure the shame of retreating back to England with nothing to show for himself. Hotspur chose to negotiate with the Tudor brothers, hashing out a potential peace agreement which would see Glendur and the Tudors receive royal pardons. This again is a potential example of Owen Glendur being comfortable with compromising with the English and remaining an English subject in some form or another. King Henry, however, was absolutely not willing to compromise, refusing to acknowledge these peace attempts, much to Hotspur's annoyance. 
In May or June 1401, O'England Dorr scored his first battlefield victory over the English at the Battle of Munnif Hudgen, near Plinlimon in central Wales. The English force present at Munnif Hudgen is believed to have been about 1,500 strong, mostly made up of mounted knights and armoured infantry, and were a mix of English soldiers from settlements in South Wales and Flemish mercenaries that had been hired for the occasion. Owen Glyndor personally led a force of 500 Welshmen against the English force, his own force mostly consisting of archers, most of whom rode into battle on the backs of presumably rather adorable hill ponies. There are no written accounts of the battle, with everything we do know being from archaeological evidence. The biggest clue we do have as to how the battle played out was the fact that there are multiple grave sites spread across the area in which the battle took place. This suggests that the Welsh tactics at the battle involved peppering the English forces with a hail of arrows, then when the slow, cumbersome English knights tried to charge the Welsh across the rough ground, the Welsh bowmen would mount their tough little ponies, who, being used to scampering across the hills of Wales, would outrun the clumsy, hulking war horses. Then, once the Welsh had put enough distance between them and the English, they would dismount and commence firing once more. The English eventually broke and ran, leaving behind around 200 dead, with many more being captured by the Welsh. While the defeat of a 1,500 strong force was a drop in the bucket for the English, the battle had huge symbolic and propaganda value for Owen. He had personally faced the English on the battlefield, and had won a decisive victory, despite being outnumbered 3 to 1. Owain was no longer a glorified bandit hiding in the mountains, he was beginning to look like a national hero. King Henry recognised this fact, and led another military campaign into Wales in October, hoping to deal a blow against Glyndor that would offset this recent defeat. Henry drove his army into central Wales, but once again Glyndor's forces melted into the hills, refusing to be drawn into an open battle. King Henry took out his frustrations on the Abbey of Strata Florida, whose monks were suspected of supporting Glyndor. Henry's men evicted the monks from the Abbey, executing one who allegedly brandished a weapon at them before proceeding to loot the Abbey, providing Glyndor's rebels with another great piece of propaganda. While the semi-discriminate brutalisation of non-combatants was part and parcel of warfare at the time, Glyndor had started his rebellion by burning down a number of Baron Grey's towns, after all. Killing churchmen and looting church properties was quite a bad look for anyone to have at the time. Ultimately, the looting of Strata Florida was the only notable event of King Henry's second campaign, with constant Welsh harassment forcing Henry to return to England by the end of October, having achieved nothing of note once again. Up north, Owain fought another battle the following month, the November 1401 Battle of Tuthill. Little is known about the particulars of this battle, other than it was related to Owain's lengthy siege of the mighty castle at Carnarvon, and that the fighting was inconclusive, with around 300 Welshmen being killed. The most significant event of the battle was Owain bringing a fancy new banner into said battle, that of a golden dragon on a white background. This was a deliberate and potent piece of symbolism on Owain's part, and the beginning of a propaganda campaign Owain would be directing for the rest of the rebellion. According to British mythology, the legendary Britannic king Uther Pendragon, the predecessor to King Arthur, carried a similar banner into battle when he successfully fought the invading Anglo-Saxons to a standstill. Owain was clearly trying to foster the idea in the minds of the people of Wales that he was the Mab Dorogan, or Son of Destiny, a messianic figure of Welsh legend who, like Arthur, would drive the English Anglo-Saxons back into the sea and claim the islands for its original Celtic inhabitants. King Henry further inflamed anti-English sentiment amongst the Welsh with the passing of a new set of penal laws against Wales in 1402. These draconian and seemingly entirely petty new laws 
forbade Welshmen from holding senior public offices, owning weapons without swearing an oath of loyalty to the King of England, owning property, holding any kind of public assembly, access to formal education for Welsh children, and finally, marriage between English and Welsh people. Unsurprisingly, this medieval version of Jim Crow pushed yet more Welsh people into jo joining Owain's cause. The degree to which the Welsh as a people rallied around Glyndwr is still very much debated, with much of southern Wales remaining under English control throughout Glyndwr's rebellion. It does appear, however, that Owain's rebellion was not simply a coalition of nobles, as many medieval rebellions were. Rather, it seemed that Owain was successful in kindling a spirit of Welsh resistance that galvanised all levels of Welsh society, and not just within Wales itself. It is noted that from 1403, the third year of Owain's rebellion, many Welsh people living or studying in England actually upped sticks and returned to Wales to join Owain's cause, an extraordinary nationalistic phenomenon that drove home the seriousness of the Glendour Rebellion to the English nobility. Early 1402 would also see Glendour capture his old rival, Baron Reginald Grey, in an ambush. Taking enemy nobles prisoner was a major part of medieval warfare, as it gave the captor the opportunity to ransom the captives for lucrative sums. In the case of Grey, Glyndwr demanded an extraordinary ransom of 10,000 marks from King Henry. Brief aside, medieval currency is very confusing, and my math is not good enough for me to accurately convert the medieval accounting unit of mark into pounds, then convert that into the present day value. But my rough estimate is that Grey's ransom was roughly equivalent to 4.5 million pounds in present day currency. King Henry would actually comply with the ransom, selling a manor in Kent to pay for his old friend's freedom. This was a good piece of PR on King Henry's part. Many lesser noble families could often not afford the ransoms demanded when members of their family were captured in battle. By demonstrating his willingness to ransom his nobles, Henry could justifiably claim that he was looking out for his nobles and deserved their loyalty in return. However, in almost no time at all, Henry would throw this goodwill out the window, and in the process, provoke a dangerous evolution of Glyndwr's rebellion. On the 22nd of June 1402, Owen's forces would once again meet the English, this time on the battlefield of Bryn Glas in eastern Wales. Welsh raiding into lands held by the Marcher Lords of eastern Wales by a 1,500 strong force under the command of one of Owen's lieutenants, Rhys Geffen, Swaravi Rhys in English, saw the Marcher Lords raise a 2,000 strong force under the command of Sir Edmund Mortimer the patriarch of the powerful Mortimer family, to hunt down the Welsh forces. Brief but important aside, the Mortimers were notable both for their wealth, being prominent Welsh marcher lords, but also for the fact that they were descendants of Edward III. Many in England argued that Edmund Mortimer's nephew, also called Edmund Mortimer, had as strong a claim to the throne of England, if not stronger, than King Henry IV which understandably caused a fair bit of tension between the King and the Mortimers. Once again, the exact details of the Battle of Bryn Glass are a little sketchy, but here is the commonly accepted account of what went down between Rhys and Mortimer on the 22nd of June. Rhys's strategy was to split his forces, which was composed mostly of archers, in two, placing the bulk of his forces on the slope of the Bryn Glass hill, while placing the remainder of his forces in a valley to the left of the hill, where they concealed themselves amongst the thick foliage. When he arrived, Mortimer assumed that the Welsh force on the slope of the hill was the entirety of the Welsh force, and began advancing up the slope under a hail of arrows. As Mortimer's men neared the Welsh line, the concealed Welsh forces on the left attacked the flank and rear of Mortimer's army, spreading panic and confusion. 
the already dire situation worsened further for Mortimer's men when contingents of Welsh archers Mortimer had recruited to try and counter the Welsh archers of Glyndwr began to fire into the backs of their English comrades. It is not clear whether they had been infiltrated by Glyndwr's agents who pre-planned the move or whether it was a spontaneous defection when they realised the battle was going against them. Regardless, the battle ended up being a decisive Welsh victory, with Rhys only losing about 200 men in return for inflicting about 600 losses on the English. Following the battle, the female camp followers of the Welsh army descended onto the battlefield. Looting the dead and finishing off non-ransomable wounded enemies was commonplace in the aftermath of medieval battles, but accounts from Bringlass claim the Welsh women in this case were determined to take revenge against the English for atrocities that had been committed during King Henry's previous campaigns in Wales. Specifically, the women supposedly cut off the genitals and noses of dead English soldiers before shoving them into their mouths and anuses respectively before leaving them to rot in the sun. Charming stuff, I know. The most important consequence of the Battle of Bringlass was that in the confusion of the battle, Edmund Mortimer himself was captured by the Welsh. However, unlike in the case of Baron Grey, King Henry refused to ransom Mortimer. It is believed that Henry's refusal to ransom Mortimer stemmed from his belief that Mortimer had deliberately gotten himself captured in order to gain the opportunity to get in contact with Owen Glyndwr, and discuss the possibility of Owain helping Mortimer pursue his family's claim on the English throne. King Henry was seemingly so convinced of this that he forbade the Percy family, whose golden boy Henry Hotspur was married to Mortimer's sister, from ransoming Mortimer themselves. Henry even went as far as to begin seizing Mortimer's estates and wealth, a typical punishment for traitors. It is still a matter of debate as to whether Mortimer actually planned to ally himself with Glyndwr before the Battle of Bringlass, but whatever his original motives, Mortimer formally allied himself with Glyndwr in November 1402 by marrying Owain's daughter Catrin, putting his considerable lands and wealth at Owain's disposal. Emboldened by his recent successes, Owain launched his own major military campaign in early 1403, marching his army southwards from his base of power in North Wales down the Twee and Usk rivers. Many villages and towns came over to Glyndwr willingly, and Owain successfully captured several English castles, including the mighty fortresses of Cardiff and Newport. By the end of the year, Owain controlled most of Wales, with only the southwest and a handful of castles in central and north Wales continuing to stubbornly hold out. In particular, Carnarvon Castle remained infuriatingly indefatigable, just about holding out against a major Welsh assault that year. Rather ominously for the English, this most recent attack on the fortress had been supported by French naval forces. French pirates had been operating off the Welsh coast since 1402, taking advantage of Owain's rebellion to attack English shipping but it now appeared that the French were directly supporting the Welsh against the English. As the French ramped up their involvement in the conflict, Owain gained a new ally amongst the English nobility. For the Percys of Northumberland, who had grown increasingly resentful towards the increasingly cash-strapped King Henry's inability to pay the wages they were due for defending the border with Scotland, and his demands that they hand over a captured Scottish noble, the Earl of Douglas, essentially stealing a valuable ransom from them, the King's intervention in their attempt to ransom Edmund Mortimer was seemingly the last straw. In the early summer of 1403, the Percys allied themselves with Glyndwr and formally rebelled against King Henry, declaring him a tyrant unworthy to rule England. The opening move of the Percys was to move against the town of Shrewsbury near the Welsh border. An advanced force of Percy soldiers, led by Henry Hotspur Percy, met up with the forces of his uncle Thomas Percy, the Earl of Worcester, outside of Shrewsbury, where the army of King Henry was prepared to face them. 
Hotspur was supposed to wait for the main Percy force under the command of his father, Earl Henry Percy, and a Welsh force under Glendour to arrive before engaging the English force camped outside Shrewsbury. However, the impetuous Hotspur allowed himself to be drawn into a battle on the 21st of July before the full rebel force had assembled. The fighting at Shrewsbury was fierce, with around 14,000 men on each side. In the opening exchange of arrow fire, the Royalist forces came off worse, with Hotspur having drawn the famed Cheshire Bowman to his side, the former elite bodyguards of Richard II, who were keen for revenge against the usurper Henry IV. In this barrage of arrows, King Henry's eldest son, Henry, the Prince of Wales, who would become the future famed warrior king Henry V, was struck in the face by an arrow, a wound that almost killed him. After a full day of bloody fighting, the climax of the battle came when Hotspur personally led a cavalry charge straight at King Henry in an attempt to kill him. However, Hotspur himself would die in the cavalry charge instead. There are conflicting accounts of Hotspur's death, but the commonly accepted one is that he was struck in the head by an arrow. When news of Hotspur's death spread through the Percy army, they broke and ran. Hotspur's body was initially buried in the town of Whitchurch, 20 miles north of Shrewsbury, but rumours of Hotspur's survival led King Henry to have his body disinterred, salted, and put on public display. Despite this important victory, King Henry was still a long way off from defeating Glendur and his allies. In the summer of 1404, Owen captured the castles of Aberystwyth and Harlech, and held court in the latter fortress. After some deliberation, Owen proceeded to make one of the most significant decisions of his rebellion. He called a parliament of Welsh nobles and clergymen together at the town of and I apologise for this, even for Welsh people, this place is bloody hard to pronounce, Machanflech. The notables present at this gathering agreed to formally crown Owen Glendur the Prince of Wales. It is worth remembering that before this point, the greatest title Owen claimed was that of the Prince of Powys. Such minor Welsh princes had been vassals of English kings in the past, and it can be argued that before the Parliament at Machanflef, Owain could still be considered simply a rebellious vassal of King Henry IV, in the same vein as his Mortimer and Percy allies. Owain's crowning changed this. He was no longer a rogue vassal. He was now the monarch of a sovereign and independent princedom of Wales. We will never know for certain what was going on in Owen Glendua's mind in the lead up to this momentous moment. Was this the culmination of the ambitions of a Welsh patriot guided by prophecy? Was this a man swept along by his own growing legend? Regardless, one thing was now certain. Any opportunity for compromise with King Henry IV and his dispossessed heir was gone. Thank you for listening. Apologies again for the delay in getting this latest episode to you, but as I mentioned previously, I had some busy real life stuff to deal with, and this topic turned out to require much more work than I expected. On the plus side, if you enjoyed this episode, you'll be getting another episode on the Glindur Rising next Friday, when we dive into the second half of the Rebellion, on the next Raid into History.